Good evening and welcome to the JDRF Northern California Chapter Annual Meeting and Research Update. I'm Jennifer Schneider. I serve as the Chapter President. I also serve on JDRF's International Board as well as on the Research Committee and on the Nominating and Governance Committee. I'm an orthopedic surgeon turned life science entrepreneur, and I've been involved with JDRF since 2003 when my daughter, who was two at the time, was diagnosed with type one. Tonight's agenda will start with a brief chapter update, followed by a report on the state of the foundation from JDRF's CEO, Dr. Aaron Kowalski. Then we will move quickly to our research discussion that I'm really looking forward to, and I know you are all as well. Our featured speakers tonight are Dr. Jeff Bluestone and Dr. Alex Marson. Their truly game-changing research on the immune system is creating the paths that we are all looking for to prevent and cure T1D. When we met last September for our first virtual annual meeting, we had just consolidated the Greater Bay Area chapter with the Inland chapter. I am thrilled to report that we have emerged stronger than ever as the Northern California chapter. Our success is made possible by you. And we hold this annual meeting to thank you, to report back to you, and let you know about the progress that you have made possible. So here's our progress report. In spite of all the challenges, this community pivoted, innovated, and leaned in in entirely new ways. The chapter launched over 100 virtual events, including monthly e-meet and greets. We provided research and clinical trial updates. And so many of you raised money in new ways, gave generously to ensure that our mission progress continued despite the challenges of the pandemic. As a result, we reached close to 5,000 people in our T1D community through virtual events with over 7,000 YouTube and Facebook views. And impressively, we raised over $8 million, vastly exceeding our goal. This is such a testament to all of you and to the power of this community. Whether you formed a walk team supported the virtual gala, made a major gift, served on the board or a committee, you all had an impact on driving the JDRF mission forward. Of course, we couldn't have done this without our outstanding JDRF chapter staff. We are tremendously grateful for their enduring commitment to our mission and to our community. A big part of that $8.1 million raised directly funded the Northern California JDRF Center of Excellence at Stanford and UCSF. You may recall that we announced this center two years ago at this very meeting when we featured Dr. Matthias Hebrock and Dr. Sung Kim. Today, we are thrilled to share that the first center grant is fully funded. Our speakers tonight, Dr. Bluestone and Dr. Marson, are both affiliated with the center, and I'm excited for you all to see the kind of brilliant scientific collaboration that is being facilitated by JDRF. It feels so great to celebrate our success and to know that despite challenging times, this community is resilient and innovative. And as we look to the coming year, I want to encourage our community to focus on the following priorities. First, our guiding principles will remain the same. Support the T1D community and drive revenue for mission. We'll do this with virtual events and we'll move to in-person as the pandemic allows. Second, clinical trial participation. Our research progress is real. And because of it, there are more clinical trials than ever. This is an incredibly exciting time and to support this new phase of medical research, JDRF is prioritizing educating our community about clinical trials and supporting clinical trial participation. Third, expanding the Beta Society. 
The Beta Society is simply the group of supporters who make a legacy gift to JDRF in their will, trust, or retirement account. I'm a member of the Beta Society, it's easy to do, and I hope you'll join me and leave a legacy of support for the future. Fourth, Game to Give. Game to Give has already driven an incredible $2 million in new revenue from video game philanthropy. This program came directly from volunteer leaders in our chapter, and we'll continue to nurture and grow this emerging initiative. There is really huge potential here. And finally, as board president, I want to partner with the board and the staff and make sure that we build on the chapter's success and create even more momentum as we all work towards our shared goal of preventing, treating, and curing T1D. Now for an update on the state of the foundation, I am very pleased to introduce to you JDRF CEO, Dr. Aaron Kowalski. Dr. Kowalski brings his scientific expertise, his personal experience living with T1D, and his incredible ability to engage the T1D community to advance JDRF's mission. Thank you, Aaron, so much for joining us this evening. Thanks, Jen. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, although, of course, I would much rather be out there in San Francisco uh, with you all like we normally would do. Uh, I'm here in my apartment in, in Greenwich Village, uh, so excuse the kind of the, the, the odd lighting. Um, had a meeting at the Helmsley Trust, so it's nice that we're getting back together in person, and I'll digress uh, for a second. I feel like an honorary Bay Area um, chapter member, as I'm normally out there so frequently, and love being out in the Bay Area, and love this chapter, and all you do uh, to raise JDRF, and I was just saying to my wife, that I expect we're going to be there much more frequently as I have a um, fourth year college student in Boston whose girlfriend just took a job at Salesforce and is moving out to San Francisco and he is uh, planning to follow her. So I expect I'll be out there even more frequently in the near future. But, you know, here we are in COVID, obviously doing this virtually. It's disappointing. Um, and I, I do look forward to giving you a brief update before passing the baton to Alex and uh, uh, Jeff. Uh, so if you go forward, I'll talk a little bit about where we are. And pre-COVID, I sat with the JDRF board, Jen included, and talked about what an incredible time it was in diabetes uh, science and in medical research progress that was happening. And what we did is we sat together and talked about our aspirations to move the organization forward. And what you'll hear from Drs. Bluestone and Marson is that the science is as robust and as exciting as ever. And type one diabetes, unfortunately, hasn't gone away. Um, during this COVID crisis, one of my wife and my close friends, their son was diagnosed. We've heard of uh, innumerable diagnoses. The COVID crisis has um, exacerbated some of the psychological uh, challenges of diabetes. And now more than ever, we need to put the pedal to the metal. So our aspirations are higher than ever we are on the cusp of what this organization set out to do, drive to cures for diabetes. And our goals start there, disease modification. Dr. Bluestone was and is one of the leaders in really the first disease modifying therapy that is in front of the FDA right now, teplizumab, and I'm sure he'll talk about that. Um, while we drive to cures, of course, we're gonna continue to um, uh, make sure that people are healthy and ease the burden of diabetes management. And you see that we have improving lives and new therapies like closed loop systems and smaller pumps and sensors and interoperability. But ultimately, my goal, um, while I've, um, uh, I'm incredibly proud of my role and uh, and being a, a part of the movement to close the loop, um, 
my goal as CEO is to, to walk away from this disease and prevent it from my kids and, and their kids and our family and your families. And that's what we call disease modifying therapies and, and different ways to treat the disease um, uh, and, and, and ultimately walk away. To do that, we need uh, funds. Uh, we need to raise our money um, as a community and we need to leverage money from others. Uh, and that's where you see right now we raise about 200 million uh, plus dollars a year as JDRF and we leverage dollars directly to uh, the tune of about $550 million a year. We wanna see that grow in the next uh, three and a half years to over a billion dollars. The COVID crisis has uh, uh, further sharpened our efficiency I've, I've always been proud of the efficiency of JDRF. Um, we're going to continue to be an even more efficient organization and continue to grow. And ultimately, growth comes through increased support. Um, over the past year, we've seen um, COVID has, has really highlighted some of the inequities that exist in our country. And that certainly happens in type 1 diabetes. We need to... Um, we need to, to, to close those gaps. We need all people with type 1 diabetes to have access to the best care. And ultimately, we need to unite as a, a, a global community to drive to cures faster. Um, it, JDRF is a staff volunteer organization, and we want the best staff to partner with uh, all of you as volunteers and, and drive uh, our mission forward. So if you go forward, um, this is our plan on a page, and I, I, I say to our team, both volunteers and staff, how do we accelerate life-changing breakthroughs? Cure, prevent, better treat T1D and its complications. Everybody should see themselves in this plan. Um, some, of, uh, the, the, some of you are scientists like Dr. Blur, uh, Bluestone and Marson will have a hands-on role in accelerating life-changing breakthroughs moving things through the pipeline and creating new therapies that change our lives. Um, some of you will help us raise more money to do that. Research takes funding. We need to be less um, uh, shy about asking people to lean in and support JDRF in our mission. And that includes, uh, you know, I think of Josh and the team, Hans uh, on gaming to give, um, the uh, various new ways that we raise money and our traditional ways like walks and galas and uh, uh, leadership gifts drive our mission forward. And ultimately, I was on the phone with a, a tremendous uh, Bay Area volunteer yesterday, Michelle Griffin, hopefully she's on tonight. We were talking about broadening our reach, adults with type one, black people with type one, Hispanic people with type one, Asian people with type one. Um, globally, across the globe, ultimately we will accelerate life-changing breakthroughs if more people get involved. And then we call powering progress kind of the foundational elements of, uh, of JDRF, being data-driven, being a um, inclusive culture, uh, uh, communicating our value proposition, having a great staff. All of this adds up to staff and volunteers accelerating life-changing breakthroughs to cure, prevent, and treat type 1 diabetes and its complications, and everybody should see themselves in this plan. So if you go forward one more, and then I'll pass the baton here. Um, you know, all of this rests upon working things through the pipeline. It sounds like jargon, but it's, it's critically important to the value proposition of what JDRF does, starting with discovery research. I mean, Dr. Bluestone, you're a tremendous champion. You are uh, emblematic of taking discovery research and moving it through the pipelines, uh, pipeline into products that ultimately change lives. And that's uh, what we do here at JDRF. We fund discovery research. We have a number of T1D fund um, supporters on, the, on this call, commercialization efforts. We have a world-class regulatory and health policy team. All of this all of these actions are means. The end is somebody doing better. My brother, myself, your loved ones, you. That is the ultimate metric for our success. And that's where our plan lies. 
is changing lives for the better, accelerating cures for T1D, and keeping people healthy and happy until we get there. So with that, tonight you'll hear the real uh, work that's going on to do that with uh, Drs. Bluestone and Marson. Um, two incredible geniuses, two incredible T1D champions, leveraging uh, immunology, molecular biology, um, ultimately with line of sight to commercialization efforts, uh, working within our center, but also within UCSF and within Sonoma Biotech. So with that, I will uh, pass the, the baton to, to Jeff and Alex to talk about the incredible work they're doing. Jeff, I think okay, I'm gonna so hand it off it, to you. Yeah, so you, can you see my presentation okay? Excellent. Jeff, before you get started, I'll just say that one thing that I, just to, to, to tie Jeff and me together is we both have New Jersey roots uh, share share uh, Rutgers uh, together. So Jeff, Scarlet Knights, uh, you know, carrying on in San Francisco and here back in New Jersey. Yeah, thanks. You know, they lost to Michigan the other day, but they beat the spread. So I did okay with my uh, Michigan friends. I want a bottle uh, of wine on that spread. <laughs> <laughs> So Aaron, thank you, and 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 thanks everybody. I although I can't see you all, I suspect that there are a lot of my friends uh, on this call, people who I respect enormously, thank enormously, and who have been um, really key to any any of the successes that we've been able to have um, over the years. And uh, I just want to take a minute to say how important it is to me. Um, to continue to, to, to work closely with the JDRF. And in fact, um, even in my new company, um, the uh, Type 1 uh, Venture Fund is, a, is an investor and I continue to stay both grateful and close to the JDRF folks and, and many of my friends. Uh, what Alex and I are going to do today is really tell you about um, the future. Um, we'll talk maybe during question and answer about the present, but I think it's a great opportunity for us to talk about the future and not the future 50 years from now, but the future a few years from now. And it really is about how medicines are fundamentally changing in uh, the world of, 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 of clinical treatments. And, um, and we're moving from what was it at one point um, simple um, chemicals that we would use to treat people to biologics, things like insulin and monoclonal antibodies that I'm sure you know about from COVID and other uh, treatments to now a whole new pillar of medicine, which is cell therapy. And, and we'll talk about this. We'll talk about what the opportunities are and, and, and where we are in this process. Before going forward, just to let people know that on the disclosure side, um, I am the CEO and president of Sonoma Biotherapeutics when we're focused on cell therapy. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about where we're going. And we've been involved in a number of studies that I'll, I'll mention. I'm also on the board of, of Gilead and, and they have a cell therapy program as well. And then finally, um, I'm on the board of Prevention, uh, which is the company that's developing uh, the NACD3 antibody that we, um, we developed uh, many decades ago. So what do I mean um, ab about a new dawn um, for medicines and cell therapies? Well, the concept is really not that complicated. If we could take cells out of our body and manipulate them and engineer them and put them back in with new capabilities, with repaired capabilities, if they're defective, with new um, uh, functionalities, we could create a living drug a drug that you would use once, put into somebody, and just like every other cell in your body, it would survive long-term, continue to form its function, and, and, and hopefully um, treat the disease that we're trying to treat. So um, this is a totally new concept that you could do this and, and be done. So the first thing is that cells are living drugs. They get in your body, they, they proliferate, they go to the sites that they want you want them to go to. They evolve to do what you want them to do, in, including in this case, to, to allow for immune protection against autoimmune diseases like type 1 diabetes. They're very specific. There's millions of years of evolution in which this, every cell in the body, whether it's a cell in your eye 
or a cell in your in your brain has evolved to perform very specific functions. And so if we could um, harness that, and then with new technologies that Alex will talk to you about, engineer for even better, we can create um, what we call polypharmaceuticals, cells that can do multiple things. And they're very efficient in doing this. They deliver things to different parts of the body. And then finally, as I've already mentioned, they live long-term. So we're not, this is not anymore a wild idea. In the past um, decade, uh, there have been multiple cell therapies that have been approved for treatment, especially in cancer. These are T cells that are engineered to be able to recognize and destroy tumors in the body. Um, and they're now becoming quite routine for many people who have leukemias and lymphomas and now are um, probably out there with a uh, hundred companies just in the Bay Area trying to design these cell therapies to treat um, other camp cancers. So we know that this is feasible. We know we can take a cell out, engineer it, and put it back. And this just tells you what that growth looks like. If you just go back that 10 years, you see how few clinical trials there were with cell therapies. And now here we are, and this is 2019 and well over 200 um, clinical trials. And I'm sure by 2021, a uh, double uh, that amount. And of course, the economics are such that it's, it's a big industry. And because it's such a big industry, it's generating a lot of enthusiasm and, and resources, which is essential. So most people in the JDRF, when they think about cell therapy, they think about beta cell replacement. They think about taking a, a, a stem cell, converting it into a beta cell and being able to transplant that beta cell to uh, replace the, the, the insulin producing cells that have been destroyed. And that is a cell therapy that's made extraordinary advances in the last few years. And I'm her sure you've heard much about that. But what I'm gonna talk about is another type of cell therapy. This is taking advantage of a very small population of white blood cells that circulate in the blood and move to various sites of inflammation and disease activity. And they're called regulatory T cells or what I'll call Tregs. And they are the fundamental police force or, or sentinels of the body as they go around and try to seek out immune responses that are out of whack. So if you start trying to recognize a foreign virus or bacteria, that's great. But then if, this, if your other white cells start attacking your own tissue like the pancreas, Tregs go and try to um, shut that back down because the body needs to stay in homeostasis. It can't have too much um, activity going one way or the other. And so what we've learned over the past 20 years is that if you're missing Tregs, you are likely to die within a year or two if you don't have a way to get those cells back. And so Tregs have since then been shown to be important in autoimmune disease and allergy, in organ uh, tissue rejection, inflammatory bowel disease, and, and other settings. And so if we could harness the power of these cells, we might be able to just repair and replace this dysfunction um, that exists in, in people. And so the goal of Tregs is to harness this and they're incredibly powerful. And so a number of laboratories and now companies are um, identifying where Tregs are deficient. It turns out type one diabetes is one of those places we found some 15 years ago. And now being able to take those cells, harvest them and use them um, therapeutically. And we know this would work based on the animal model studies. This is just a small example of the number of different animal studies where putting a Treg back into a mouse will either protect or cure from disease. Um, the the, the non-squared ones like inflammatory bowel disease or lupus, uh, MS, uh, are, have all been shown in multiple settings, including interestingly things even like stroke and ALS. But the most dramatic results have been seen in type one diabetes where, and this is work that Kishi Tong in my laboratory at the time as a postdoc and now a faculty member and a member of the Center of Excellence was involved in where we were able to show that just a few of these Treg cells when put back into a mouse that would develop diabetes would protect this mouse totally from getting diabetes. And in an eyelid transplant setting, 
would protect the islets from being rejected. And this mouse work really encouraged us to get excited about moving into the clinic. And so we developed a, a, a human equivalent of the mouse work in type one diabetes and did a trial now five years ago showing that we could grow these cells out of a patient with type one diabetes and put them back in the patient and show that they were safe. And, um, and many of the patients actually continued to make insulin over a long period of time. A similar study was done in Poland by another group with very similar results. And that really encouraged us to get excited about the possibility that Tregs, we could, we could actually use them as a therapeutic. And so over the years, we have found that in now um, 10 different clinical trials conducted at UCSF, that these cells are safe um, and can be put into a patient. They're long lived, um, staying around for at least a year. But we also learned from the animal studies that if we could target them more selectively to the tissue that was being um, destroyed, that we would have an even better chance of using these cells uh, therapeutically. And so um, based on work that was done in the cancer field, um, many of the people working now are developing ways of introducing into these cells a specific receptor, like a lock and a key. And the, the key here, what we call a CAR, um, is able to now recognize a specific protein present in the pancreas and not everywhere else in the body or present in a joint of a patient with RA or present in the gut in a patient with, uh, with inflammatory bowel disease. And by targeting that, these cells go to the site and get triggered through this CAR and now will turn on these Tregs, but only at the site um, where they need to work. And so the idea is, is that we will take these cells out, modify them with the CAR that sees a specific eyelid antigen, grow them up in large quantities and inject them back into the patient to shut down the disease. And here in a proof of principle study that, that Tong has done using a particular CAR, shown that she can actually prevent progression of a disease by taking these antigen specific cars and putting them in here in a human cell um, that into an, an animal uh, model. So we think this is a great time for being able to create these new drugs and to do it in a highly effective way. And, and to end and turn it over to my colleague to point out that now is just opening the door of the future because we can take this concept and now really take advantage of a lot of the new biology that's out there. We can think about generating these Tregs out of embryonic stem cells. So perhaps we will be able to generate both the islets and the Tregs out of the same stem cells and transplant them together. We can modify these cells in ways that Alex will tell you so that they will survive even longer and perhaps even work across patients so that we take a cell from one individual manipulate them so that they become invisible and create a universal cell therapy for others. So we're really at the tip, the bleeding edge of this field now. We'll hopefully, um, with now several companies, uh, four or five now, all in this area in type 1 diabetes, be able to take this therapy now and move it uh, rapidly towards um, clinical um, um, uh, trials and, and hopefully see some success. So I'll, I'll stop there and I'll turn it over to my colleague. Are you uh, muted? I, yeah, I, I hope you're now seeing my screen. Is that is that true? Yep, great, great Alex. All right, well, thank you so much for inviting me tonight. Um, I, I see that there are people on this call who are close friends and people who are true partners in everything I'm gonna tell you about and enabling all of this research. So thanks to all of you and thanks for having me. And I would also just say it's a special honor to speak after Jeff, who has been a, a mentor to me and welcomed me to UCSF when I showed up at the UCSF Diabetes Center and started my lab there about nine years ago. So, in the, in, and now it's nice to pick up and tell you how what we're doing and really builds on what Jeff just told you about. For the fundamental goal of research in my lab is to understand how the DNA inside the T cells in our body 
programs the important behaviors of those T cells. And as we've gotten better at understanding that, we have now entered into an era where we're not just doing research to understand those programs, we're actually able to go in and start replacing DNA sequences to reprogram specific behaviors into T cells, including the Tregs that Jeff just told you about, that take these cells and transform them into cellular immunotherapies to treat type one diabetes and other diseases. And this is this vision of taking cells, T cells out of the body, taking them out of circulation from a blood sample and then genetically engineering them, putting a new program into them and then reinfusing them into a patient to treat disease is supercharged by the revolutionary power of CRISPR. And I'll tell you a little bit more about CRISPR, but basically think about CRISPR as something that now allows us to go in, pick a particular DNA sequence, remove a piece of DNA sequence that's limiting the function of T cells, fix an individual mutation that is causing a patient disease, or actually pick a particular place on that DNA sequence and replace or insert a whole new program to give a new behavior to T cells that will uh, make them more effective at treating disease when they get infused into a patient. So very briefly, I'm sure many of you have now heard about CRISPR. This was the subject of a Nobel Prize to Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier last year. CRISPR is a tool that has transformed every aspect of biology. And what it, you can think of it is, is it's a very, very easy to use scissor that, that allows us to very quickly pick a particular sequence along the chromosome and at, with very great precision, make a cut in that DNA strand. And the reason we care so much about that is if we can cut DNA at a particular place, we can start to make alterations. At the site of a cut, we can actually disrupt a genetic sequence to, to get rid of that genetic sequence. Or if we actually deliver CRISPR along with an extra piece of DNA, we can actually trick the, the cell into incorporating sequence from that extra piece of DNA. And this allows us to actually paste in a new DNA sequence at that precise place in the chromosome and install a new genetic program. So this all sounds very theoretical. I, I, would, I wanna show you what this actually looks like because the secret is it's actually incredibly easy to do. Uh, this is uh, Ryan, who was a technician in my lab mixing up T cells. This is Jessica, who is a grad student in my lab. She's now at Sonoma working on this further. She's mixing up CRISPR molecules and these extra pieces of DNA and they get, heat, they get heated up and then they get mixed in with the T cells that come out of a blood sample. And this can be done in these 96 well plates. So each different well, you can make a different genetic edit in T cells from a blood sample. And then they go into this machine that delivers a small electrical pulse. And that somehow makes the cells permeable and CRISPR slides in. And actually the CRISPR is guided to a particular site of the DNA, makes this cut, and then the cell's own repair machinery will start incorporating the piece of DNA that we have put in. So it goes into this incubator and now CRISPR is already underway, actually changing the genetic code of these cells. So as a proof of concept, what we started with was actually pasting in DNA sequences that made the T cells start to turn green. And we could just see under a microscope that we had actually reprogrammed these cells to turn fluorescent green. Now that's not where the ultimate goal that was, that showed us that this was working but we wanted this to actually go and help patients with type one diabetes and other autoimmune diseases. So we have been heavily focused on this family. Uh, this is a family that has three children with different autoimmune diseases. One of them has developed type one diabetes very early in life, within the first year of life. Another sibling doesn't have type one diabetes, but has multiple autoantibodies, suggesting a high future risk of type one diabetes. And an older sibling, doesn't have type one diabetes, but has a very severe autoimmune attack with autoimmunity targeting a number of different uh, cells in the blood system, autoimmune neutropenia and autoimmune ITP, autoimmune attack on red blood cells as well. And that older sibling has actually been sick enough that the, the family has been advised to consider getting a bone marrow transplant. But they know the risks of bone marrow transplant and they have been looking around for alternatives. Now, because there's three children in this family that are affected by different manifestations of autoimmune disease, they actually went and got DNA sequencing done 
And DNA sequencing has revealed very, very rare mutations that are causing autoimmune disease in these children. Turns out that each parent has a very rare mutation in a gene called IL2RA. This is a gene that has a number of roles in the immune system, but one of the places where this gene is absolutely critical is in regulatory T cells. And that's where this connects back to what Jeff has said. Turns out that the children with these mutations, they have cells that kind of look like regulatory T cells, but they don't work properly because of the mutations that are affecting their regulatory T cells. So these children have been seen in centers around the country, including by our colleague, Kevin Harold at Yale, who called us up and asked, Could, do you think CRISPR might be able to help the children in this family? And so uh, we've actually been getting blood samples mailed to us from these children. And when we analyze the T cells in these children compared to a healthy donor, this is the actual only actual data I'll show you, the um, healthy donors should have lots of cells with IL-2RA on their surface, that's shown here. But when we look at the cells from these children, we just really see almost no IL-2RA on the surface of their T cells. But we were able to use this CRISPR cut and paste maneuver very quickly in the lab. We could actually fix one of these mutations and restore high levels of IL-2RA to, uh, to the patient's own T cells. Now, because UCSF has, under Jeff's leadership, invested so heavily in building a manufacturing pipeline to make regulatory T cell therapies, we now have a special opportunity to actually take these patients' regulatory T cells and take them out of circulation, expand them in a way that would be safe. And this is the team that has been put in place by Jeff here at UCSF. Um, but now we want to add an extra step. Now we want to use CRISPR in a way that's compatible with a clinical trial to go in and actually fix one of these mutations. And here, Brian Shai is an MD-PhD who's a, a postdoc in my lab, who's the first cell therapy fellow at UCSF who's been leading this effort, working very closely with our colleagues at the Innovative Genomics Institute at Berkeley, including Jennifer Doudna, to use this CRISPR technology to correct this mutation in regulatory T cells. So this has been a huge investment, but we are now heading to the place where we hope within the next year, we'll be able to actually get FDA approval to give the first gene corrected regulatory T cell therapy, fixing this individual mutation, reinfusing it into this uh, oldest affected sibling in the family. Now, we really hope that this is a, gets at the fundamental cause of autoimmunity in this child or a young adult, but that's not where this ends. This is a stepping stone also to use the power of genetic engineering in regulatory T cells. So we have been heavily invested in being able to install gene programs, including putting in a new DNA sequence into T cells that will direct, redirect what a T cell will recognize. So this could be a car, like what Jeff told us about, or a T cell uh, receptor that is a sensor on the surface of the cell. Now those, those sensors determine what a T cell will recognize. They, here what I've shown you is we can engineer a T cell that would kill a cancer cell. But now if we put a T, a T cell receptor into regulatory T cells, we can start directing regulatory T cells into the islets to actually go in and create an immune tolerant environment to protect T cells in the, in the, in the, uh, to protect the islets. Now, I'll just end by saying the power of CRISPR doesn't end there. It's not just to make this correction, it's also teaching us fundamental lessons of biology. We don't do these experiments one at a time. We actually, if there's 20,000 genes in the genome, we can now test 20,000 genes in parallel. We can get rid of every gene very, very quickly and see which are the ones that are blocking T cells from working properly, or even what new genes can we add in? So we test gene additions in, in, in cells, and then we create these pools of cells and we race them against each other. So we've started this with cancer, where now we, in addition to putting in a sensor that determines what a T cell will recognize, we can add an extra gene product that will determine the state of the cell. And then we can race these cells against each other and see when they get to a tumor, which, which, which are the added gene programs that make the cells more effective, more stable, more, proliferate better. And by analogy, we're doing the same thing now in regulatory T cells, testing many different gene programs that we can install into a regulatory T cell to figure out which are the programs that will make them stable inside the islet, which ones will start to secrete molecules that protect the islet. So we're learning these lessons of biology faster and faster, and all of that gets translated 
into an accelerated pipeline for the next generation of regulatory T cell therapies. This is much bigger than any one lab can do. So we have built a community around this. This is a partnership between the Gladstone Institutes here at Mission Bay, where I'm sitting, and UCSF to create an institute around a new field of genomic immunology that takes advantage of the power of genome sequencing, genome editing, synthetic biology, and all the expertise in making cell T cell immunotherapies that has been accumulated here at UCSF. So we are put to, putting this team together. I'm showing you the core members here, and we're working in close partnership with UCSF, uh, Diabetes Center, and with the JDRF Center of Excellence to take all this expertise and make sure that lessons that are learned for cancer immunotherapies are being translated over to regulatory T cells to treat type one diabetes and other autoimmune diseases. So with that, I wanna stop there. Thank a huge number of people who are involved in these efforts. And thank you all for everything you're doing to support uh, research and move us closer to cures for type one diabetes. Well, thank you so much for, um, for those really just incredible um, presentations. It, it's really just tremendous. Um, do we have uh, questions in the in the chat? I think we can we can start with one that came up, uh, Dr. Bluestone. Do you want to talk a little bit about where teplizumab is now? That's certainly something that this community is uh, interested in, and I know that uh, as you said, you've been involved from the start. So we'd love to hear a little bit more about teplizumab. Sure, happy to. And I think someone asked a question um, in, in the chat room as well. Um, yes, there's nobody more interested in this therapy than me. Um, and I am not, I'm not quitting until we get it over the finish line. Um, the good news is that, um, as many of you know, when the FDA, uh, the advisory committee uh, looked at the clinical data, from the trial that was conducted through TrialNet on the at-risk patients that Kevin Harrell led, that they were very excited about the clinical data. They approved moving forward to approval um, of the drug for treatment of, of at-risk patients. So I think all in all, there's uh, still opportunity there. I'm confident that, uh, that there's going to be continued efforts to get this drug uh, fully approved. Um, and, uh, and available for people not just at risk, but eventually uh, individuals who uh, have new onset disease and maybe ultimately people who are given uh, islet transplants. That's, that's, just, that's just great. Um, this whole world of, uh, of Tregs is just so incredibly exciting. And to hear your presentations and then to know that there's a drug uh, that's already going, have gone through um, all of this work and is actually at FDA right now is, is just particularly exciting. So thank you for that. Okay, uh, Jen, I might jump in and I, I just yeah. have a question that just popped in my mind as, as Jeff was uh, talking. Jeff, you and I have talked about this before, but I'd, I'd be really interested given your comments just now on teplizumab and Alex, you as well. One of the folks on the call tonight, she and I were on the phone earlier uh, this week and she was diagnosed um, as an adult and still makes C-peptide. And what's going on here in terms of slow progress, progression in adults and faster progression in kids? And what does that tell us about teplizumab or other CAR-T type approaches? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, uh, you know, we, we're, we're learning every day about the immune system and, 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 and how it exists. And one of the most interesting things that you probably all are aware of in the last year uh, with the COVID vaccines is COVID vaccines work better in younger people than they do in older people, right? The immune system ages just like we all age. And so th that's, that's, that's probably not great if you're trying to protect yourself against viruses or maybe cancers, but it actually turns out in autoimmunity, the progression of the disease is slower in older people because their immune system isn't as robust as it was when they were younger. And I think that's one of the major reasons why young people, um, especially pre-puberty where their immune system is really cranking, 
um, are more uh, aggressive when they get the disease. There are probably other variables as well having to do with uh, other immunity and infections and stuff, but I think that's a, a major reason. How is that going to impact on our ability to develop these therapies, not just for type 1 diabetes, but for diseases like, like rheumatoid arthritis, where it's a much older population that gets it? And I think the good news is, is that what we've learned is that you can reverse that aging. You can actually take a cell and through a combination of, of growth factors and, and processes actually recreate a younger cell. And in fact, that's being used in cancer now quite a bit these sort of stem-like cells that people are trying to grow out in culture to inject in the cancer patients so they get a more robust anti-cancer response. And one of the major programs um, in our company and certainly others is to really make sure that the cells we're growing out have all the attributes of a young cell so that we can maximize the chance that they'll be able to function well in, in an older individual. Alex, I was gonna ask you, um... Uh, I see a couple of questions in the in the comments, and one of the things that we, well, one of the challenges in diabetes that I find interesting, and Jeff and I have been on panels and, and at FDA talking about this, is we have um, endocrinologists treating diabetes, but diabetes is an autoimmune disease, and there's kind of a chasm between the risk um, uh, tolerance of endocrinologists and with you know the endocrinologists on the call can can comment on this, but we've seen it certainly um, versus novel immunotherapies and perceived risk. So one of the questions I'm seeing uh, popping up is what is the risk of gene editing or immunotherapies? Um, and I would, I'd be interested, you know, uh, in CRISPR um, gene editing risks and and then you are Jeff commenting on broader immunotherapy risk. Yeah, I mean, I, I, there's, a, there's a lot to tackle there. Um, I do think that the new classes of medicines, like what, what Jeff and I are talking about, tend to start with patients who have severe risk. And that's what, that's what we've seen in the, a lot of these technologies being developed in the cancer space. But I think it's absolutely critical to, to look for opportunities to take what we're learning in the cancer space and say, how quickly can we move that into autoimmunity and type one diabetes? And I think that there is a progression to do that aggressively, but responsibly, or responsibly. And you know, I think that that has been part of the motivation of going after this rare genetic disease that I, that I talked about to talk with someone, that, to try to help someone who has a very severe disease that would otherwise need a bone marrow transplant, also where we have clarity of a particular mutation that we can go in and fix. So the combination of clarity and severity makes this a place where we can go in and start applying CRISPR to Tregs. And I think from there, hopefully we learn lessons and build up comfort and develop a track record that allows us to extend this to more common forms of autoimmunity to type one diabetes and put in more complex programs. So I think the safety tracker record and doing this responsibly along the way is how we get this, uh, march this towards more and more uh, uh, patients, including family members of people on this call. Um, I will just add that, you know, I think that that's been one of the big attractions to the UCSF Diabetes Center for me. It's one of the special places. I don't know how many places there are in the country, this might be the only one that so intimately brings the endocrinology and the beta cell biology together with the immunology. And I think that that is really critical for, for everything we're talking about. One thing that I, I didn't mention, but I see in, in some of these questions is, how is this gonna be applied to people who already have type one diabetes? If the beta cells are, are gone, have been destroyed, how, how will the Treg therapies work? And I think there, it's really critical to think about how do we engineer a combination cell therapy, you know, and I think that once we start thinking about gene editing and putting new programs into cells, I think one of the huge opportunities that we need, to, that we are thinking about very aggressively is how do we make the regulatory T cells, engineer them to communicate with the beta cell replacement therapies that are being engineered? Can we make regulatory T cells that go in and specifically protect those immune, those re replaced beta cells without causing global immune compromise. And I think that there's enormous opportunities there to use the power of this type of synthetic biology and gene engineering to make these cell types talk to each other to create a combined therapy. 
That's fantastic. Jeff, I, a question for you about your transition. You are now um, president and CEO of Sonoma, and I am, am, am a huge believer that you know, the ultimate goal of JDRF and our responsibility is to drive improved outcomes for type one people. And while I grew up as a researcher, um, I, in the context of my role at JDRF, I say research is a means, not an end. Ultimately, we need therapies that, that change the course of this disease and improve outcomes for people. So talk a little bit about your transition to Sonoma. It's part of our T1D fund, uh, you know, where we invest in discovery research, but also in companies working on therapies. And I know some, some of your work is confidential, but if you could just comment on, you know, how you've made this transition and, and what role T1D may play in it. Sure, um, happy, ha happy to. Um, so let me start with, with an anecdote. So the anecdote is that I, before this job, I ran something called the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy. And at one of the retreats, we had a, um, a panel discussion among venture capitalists. And the question was asked, um, is there any difference between tech companies and biotech companies, tech companies being computer and, and, and the like? And one of the VCs says, oh yeah, there's one big difference. So the big difference is that in tech companies, everybody who is a founder and starts one moves into the company. And in biotech, none of these guys ever or gals move into the company. They stay in their university jobs and with their tenure and, and stuff. And having lived through teplizumab, which you've probably gotten the hint has been, been something I've been working on for 30 years. I, the epiphany I had after that comment was, is that if I really want to see Treg therapy, which I believe in dearly, make it all the way to a therapy, I'm going to have to do it myself. I know that sounds egotistical, but I don't want to in five years go back and said, you know, I gave it to a company. They didn't do it the way I would have done it. It's been slower. So I decided that if I want to get a drug all the way to the, to the finish line, that I need to, sh to have the kind of passion and commitment that, that is going to be necessary to do that. Um, academia is a place of great ideas. And I think that you've heard Alex talk about really incredible new uh, opportunities that are created by great ideas. Companies are about execution, which is taking those great ideas and really driving that towards products. It's a learning for me because I'm an idea guy, but it, it does tell me a lot about where we need to put our efforts to really get cures for diseases like type one. It's not just about the academic labs. It's not just about big pharma. It's really the whole food chain. It's the whole system. It's the engineers. It's the, it's the regulatory people. It's the, it's the scientists. And so what this has done for me, it's allowed me to move to an, a, a phase in my life where I can focus on those later challenges. How do we actually drive this to, to therapeutics? I still believe in academia as being the source of great, great opportunities and hope to be able to continue to partner with Alex and other people to do it. But for now, at least, I feel very committed to being in that, that office every day, helping people get over the finish line. Maybe I can just quickly add to that. You know, I think since this is the Northern California chapter, I, I think I think it's worth talking about something that is very special that's happening here in the Bay Area. I, I think that we are really seeing an emergence of an ecosystem. And you know, I think it's 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 not any individual lab. It really requires coalitions of labs. It requires clinical trials happening in an academic setting, which is really a new way of thinking about pushing the boundary and getting to proof of concept what's possible. And it requires partnerships between academia and spin out companies and startups that can take this and execute exactly the way that Jeff is talking about. And I think we're seeing that. You know, I think that you know, I'm involved with a number of companies. I'm, uh, we're working together with other labs that are involved with different companies. And I think that there's this, this uh, experimental setup where we're able to take lots of different ideas and try to move them forward. Is there gonna be the most efficient and fastest path to come up with actual cures? Yeah, and, and, and Aaron, I shouldn't be the ultimate politician here and ignore the second part of your question. So um, at, at Sonoma, 
bio, I, I, I believe that type one diabetes remains um, a major uh, focus for us. It's not the only focus. And in fact, based on some of the things that Alex talked about, which is, you know, high risk early, uh, early trials is, is necessary in patients that have very severe diseases that we're working in a number of autoimmune areas, but we are very committed to the type one diabetes space. We have research programs in that space. And interestingly, and you probably know this, but others on the calls may not, as I talked about this delicate balance between the immune system and regulation and the importance of, of, um, of getting rid of the bad guys that are destroying the tissue, we have programs in-house that are trying to do both, not just use Treg therapy to try to treat disease, but also try to eliminate some of the cells that are destroying the tissue in the first place. And that program is uh, very much a type one diabetes focused program right now. So I think that um, we like other companies have been really committed to getting the type one diabetes and getting these cells and these uh, efforts there. Um, it will take some time, but I think you'll be seeing clinical trials in this space in the near future. It's great. It, it really plays into uh, JDRF's strength. I mean, we always talk about the whole pipeline and you all are, are living that pipeline. JDRF is committed from the early research all the way through to getting treatments, cures, et cetera, to, to patients. So it's super exciting to hear um, your involvement across that, that whole pipeline. Just uh, uh, scanning, there's so many interesting questions um, here. Jeff, one of our uh, uh, participants wrote you, and I saw you responded, Karis, talking about participating in the tiplizumab study in residual beta cell function post, um, you know, dosing this therapy. And maybe both of you and, and Jen, uh, uh, you know, as, as somebody who has obviously family members affected with diabetes. I think one of our challenges as we speak to FDA and JDRF has been leading a charge of a multi-stakeholder group talking about outcomes beyond A1C and residual C peptide. And you know this idea, I think for, for a while, we thought we might just snap our fingers and walk away from diabetes, but it'll probably be an incremental series of um, steps forward and Residual beta cell function is really important. And how, how, how are you guys thinking about that in terms of steps towards full restoration of normal A1Cs versus, you know, I know that, for example, Vertex is going after hypo aware people and their cell uh, replacement stem cell derived product. How, how do you think about that? Yeah, I, I am. Um, I, I, I've learned to become an incrementalist uh, a bit, but I think that the 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 biggest um, advance in the last few years, and JDRF has been leading on this as much as anyone, which is really trying to help the FDA understand that you actually have this disease well before you end up in the emergency room and. With with you know in in with with ketoacidosis right this disease to start this in many cases starts years ahead and so as we become able to to define the disease better we can think about how do we get these interventions in earlier not something that we normally make we don't make a lot except for vaccines we don't make a lot of drugs to prevent we make a lot of drugs to treat. But once we can convince the FDA that even before the clinical diagnosis, people are, are, are really manifesting the disease, then we can start thinking about how to get in earlier. Obviously you need to have safe therapies um, to get in earlier, especially getting into children. But I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's frankly a definitional problem as much because hemoglobin A1C is a sign of longstanding dysregulation of glucose, right? It's not a sudden event. And so if we build all of our clinical trials on having to read out something like that, you're, you're reading out something that's late in the game. So um, I think the, the work that SEMA slash Vertex is doing in trying to work with the, um, with, with the patient populations that are most brittle, same thing with Viasite, 
really is going to give us a proof of principle that if you can get in and even partially um, rebuild that, that beta cell reserve, that you're going to find some great consequences of that. It's going to be like being, and many of you know this, it's like being back in the honeymoon period. It's not like you don't have the disease, but your ability to be able to control subtle changes, it affects hypoglycemia as much as hyperglycemia. And I think there's going to be a place um, for that. Is it the same as getting off of insulin totally? No. Is it the perfect end game? Hopefully not. But I think it's a great way to think incrementally about how do we take a disease where it sits today with someone who has zero insulin production and really move back to a place where you can at least um, take the edge off and really create some better control. Uh, and I think that that's, that's, that's feasible. Some good friend, Dr. Patipa from uh, Florida, who's li listening in, Mike, great to, uh, to see that you're in. And he's asking, he's lived 52 years, no diabetes complications, super successful physician career, amazing guy. And he wants to know about, would his immune system teach you anything or, or is Treg something that would be um, uh, potentially protective to other people? Or is there a story in there that to, to learn from? It's an, an, an excellent question. Um, I believe type 1 diabetes is like many other autoimmune diseases. It's a relapsing and remitting disease. You get a flare and then you go back into remission, you get a flare. Unfortunately, in diabetes, because you can't rebuild beta cells because they're dead and gone, you don't see it like you do in lupus or in MS or others. So I think what that tells us is that there is an attempt by the immune system to be controlling this unwanted immune response. And that's why you go into remission. I'd like to believe that Tregs play an important role in that to get. And so someone who is long-term um, diabetic, who, who has still even small amounts of beta cell function, and there are a lot of folks out there that still have some residual beta cell function, it's, it's probably a consequence of the immune system actually re-regulating itself to some degree. It's a little late in the game, unfortunately, to become insulin independent, but it's enough to have someone maybe be complications free, maybe be. And so there are a number of studies going on now. We had one we had started a few years ago, looking at people who have long-term disease. Um, uh, Dr. King at, at Jocelyn was, has been studying this for years and looking at these patients to ask, is their immune system going to teach us something about how how to keep a control on an immune system that's out of, out of whack. So I think the answer is likely yes. Um, finding enough patients and the variability and stuff is challenging, but I think studying people who have disease in the long term and don't have complications or maybe even have some insulin production could turn out to be a really important set of insights for the, for the community. And maybe I just amplify that even further, you know, I think one of the things that I've really learned from, from Mark Anderson, who's on the call and is serving as the UCSF uh, director of the Diabetes Center, is the value of learning from patients and lo looking at outlier cases to make sure that we're learning everything possible about genetics and other factors that could be driving outlier events. And you know, without commenting on the specifics here, I think that that is a, a strong motivation to be able to, to really learn from the clinical enterprise and get insights that then we can think about how to amplify or engineer into cell into regulatory T cells so that they, those benefits of better re functioning regulatory T cells could be extended to others in the form of engineered T reg therapies. I have two more questions before we need to, to sign off, but Alex, I'm uh, struck by when you highlighted your lab, having worked in the lab for many years, you have a big lab, you have an unbelievable background uh, for folks, uh, both you and Jeff are really humble guys with incredible chops. <laughs> and your background for the folks listening in, if you just Google Alex's background, it's unbelievable. And so, so I think there's kind of two parts to this question. One is, you know, how did you pick diabetes? And I guess the second is comments you know, it's, 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 I always feel a little guilty when we're on these calls that there's so many people, incredibly smart people who work for 
against this problem. So talk talk maybe to the to the folks on the, the, the call about what motivated you to get into diabetes and you know what what a team under your lab looks like. Well, first of all, I think that's way too generous, but I, I appreciate it, Aaron. So thank you. Um, I, I think there's there's several layers. You know, I I sat in I went to med school. I sat in med school classes and just was struck again and again throughout the first two years of class classroom time in med school how the immune system came up again and again across diseases. And I, I hadn't been planning on studying the immune system, but felt like it was it was something that just shouldn't be shouldn't be avoided. It was it seemed like that was the cross-cutting thing across human health and human diseases. And looked for opportunities when I then switched and got immersed in, in research questions and switched into a combined MD PhD program, my research kept gravitating back to questions of the, how does the immune system work and how does it regulate itself? And actually it was during, I had my first conversation with Jeff when I was a, when, in grad school. And then when I came out to, to uh, UCSF, I was hugely inspired by what Jeff was building to try to understand how we could use the immune system uh, to treat diseases. And, and, I, and I have to say a big part of the answer is, is Jeff, you know, Jeff, Jeff's mentorship and what he had built in the diabetes center brought me into the fold. And, you know, I think that was, that was the entry point to diabetes. You know, and, and I think what continues to motivate me now is people on the call, people I've met whose lives have been affected by this. I, and I you know, now have a very personal viewpoint of what we're trying to do here. And the, the, the mission is very, very tangible to, to help people and, and make a difference in people's lives. You know, it's it's great. I just finally decided that I finally decided to look and see who's on, which is great. And and what's great is the bookends. So um, one of the person people that asked the question is is Leo Ferrara, who is the most recent postdoc to have left my lab and PC Tong, and Jerry Grodsky, who's probably one of the fathers of uh, diabetes uh, insights and research and development of, of assays for insulin. And so that's the kind of legacy that's happened throughout UCSF over decades now. And, 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 uh, and Alex mentioned Mark. So whenever, you know, people come to UCSF to be immunologists or to be um, a stem cell biologist, and then they start interacting with the immunology community and they start, I mean, the diabetes community, and you start seeing the opportunities. You know, we know so much about the disease largely because of the funding by JDRF. We know so much about what we need to achieve and, um, and, and it's hard. And certainly we all wish we were, we were done. But I think that it's, it's, it's an amazing thing for me to have been able to work with Kevin Harold, who obviously has the disease himself and be a 30 year collaborator with him to work with people at UCSF who have been the pioneers and to help train students who are gonna take it to the next level. It's just a community that is so um, dynamic, important, the number of things that have been, you know, from genetics to cell therapy. So um, when an Alex comes for a visit, he sees that and it's just an incredible um, motivator for all of us. I know we're wrapping up, but the horizon, Jeff, Alex, what, do you expect that somebody like Aaron Kowalski will see immunotherapies help me restore beta cell function or some normalization of glycemia in my lifetime? Yes. I like Jeff's optimism going with it too. When, when we first did, when we first saw the first successes in immunotherapy and cancer, it was not, it wasn't like, my God, everybody is cured on day one. There was a small population of people, but it started the field to just change. And I think, I don't know if it's gonna be you, Aaron, or it's gonna be a, a Karis, or it's gonna be a child, but there's gonna, there are gonna be people out there that immunotherapy works for and makes a gigantic difference for their disease. But that, that's not the answer, that's the start, right? We're at the end of the beginning. And I think what that will do is encourage all of us to think not just about um, how, to, how to make it better, but how to make it better for more people. And that's, I think, the future. It's not, it's not gonna be 
all of a sudden one day we walk out of the room and say we're done. So I can answer yes, because I know there are going to be people who benefit from immunotherapy, period. And they're happening now. And there'll be drugs to do that. But it's only the start. So no one should think it's the end. It's just the start. Love wow. It. Well, that was a that was a truly fantastic answer. And uh, Aaron, thanks for the great question at the end there. Um, you know, thank you, Dr. Bluestone, Dr. Marson, Aaron. It, it, it's really incredibly inspiring to hear what you uh, are are doing. We are incredibly grateful that you are bringing your your brilliance, uh, your time to type one diabetes. Um, Really, it's, it's just been incredible to hear about the progress that is being made. And uh, for, for those of you joining us for the meeting, thank you for your time. Uh, we thank you for making this kind of progress possible. I think you heard a couple of times about the role that JDRF has played in bringing these researchers um, to be interested in type one diabetes. So, so thank you all, we, we absolutely could not do it without you. So if you haven't already done so, please get involved. So just some of the opportunities available are listed on this slide. You can contact us however you would like. We are happy to find an engagement path that excites you. Um, and as we're coming up on November, our virtual One Walk is right around the corner. We have really a, a delightful and inspiring short video that we're going to show you, um, and that should get you very excited to join us in the One Walk. So thank you so much. Hi, everyone. We're here to let you know that the JDRF One Walk is a chance to show the world that together, we can make T1D history. If you're living with T1D or care about someone who does, you can help improve their lives today and tomorrow. Your participation in the One Walk will help accelerate the most promising research that aims to cure, treat, and prevent T1D. So now is the time to lace up your shoes and get moving. We can't get closer to cures without you. We're welcome for my wife, Ansley, here, who has lived with T1D since she was five years old. And for our two children, so that they can have a future without the fear of T1D. Who will you walk for? We walk for people like Caleb with type 1 diabetes. We walk to help JDRF find a cure. I walk because I have type 1 diabetes. I walk because I have type 1 diabetes. I walk because I have type 1 diabetes. And I walk for them. I'm walking to encourage all of these families to stay strong, stay hopeful, and know we are all one team together, the JDRF team. We walk because JDRF has a clear path and invests in our daughter's future. I don't like diabetes because there's a needle in my arm like this one. And I like GDRF because people support me and other people to cure diabetes. We want to support Jeffrey and diabetes research. Please join us! Join us! Join us. Join us, please. Join us. And help make T1D history. Okay, thank you all so much for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your evening.